regular meeting number 41 will now come to order. And please stand for the playing of the Pledge of Allegiance. Tim Cinziano, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, we are pleased and honored to have uh, Pastor Dr. John Little of uh, Resurrection Missionary Baptist Church on my beloved South Side. Pastor, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we pause now to say thank you. Thank you for this day that you have given unto us, a day that we've never seen before and we never shall see again. We thank you that you allowed us to rise this morning and go about our daily duties. Yeah. And we've come now this evening to discuss a business that is important important to the citizens of this city. And so I pray now that you would bless our council, bless each one, give them the wisdom uh, and that they may be able to preside and make decisions that would benefit all the residents of our dear city. We pray, Lord, that you would give them the fortitude to be able to make the tough decisions. Even sometimes it may be unpopular, but Lord, let it be beneficial to us all. So guide their hearts, guide their decision making, and give them peace at the end of the day, knowing that they have made the right decisions. We pray for all the staff and those that support them. We pray that you would continue to give them what they need to help undergird the leaders of our city. We pray for Columbus as a whole, that you would continue to make this city the best city in the world where people can raise a family. And so we pray, Lord, that your grace will abound throughout Columbus as a whole. Lord, where there's confusion, we ask that you will bring about peace. Where there's misunderstanding, Lord, we ask that you will bring about understanding. We pray that you will continue to bless this city as only you can. And when we've done all that we can do, you will reward us for that which we have done. We thank you now. Continue to bless and keep. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting. Pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12, any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any resolutions by members of council? Council member Elizabeth Brown. Council member Mitch Brown. Council member Remy. Uh, no resolutions this evening. Just looking forward to our community meeting on the uh, tomorrow evening on the north. Where is that? The um, looking at my calendar here at 248 East 11th Avenue. Um, that'll be all of us, or at least most of us, in attendance, six to seven thirty, and then I'll be hosting a pool party at um, 
road, uh, 1100 Rhodes Avenue on Friday at, from 2.30 to 4. At the, it's a community pool party. So looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Councilman Remy. Councilman Page. Thank you, President Hardin. This evening, I have resolution 0226X-2018. And at this time, I would like to call Arthur Hurst, Vice President of the Columbus Urban League, to the podium in order to receive this resolution. Again, resolution 0226X-2018, to commemorate the centennial of the Columbus Urban League and to recognize the 2018 National Urban League Conference, which will be held here in Columbus. The Columbus Urban League was founded in 1918 as a community-based nonprofit advocacy organization, and their mission is to empower African Americans and disenfranchised groups through economic, educational, and social progress. The Columbus Urban League is ranked in the top 5% of the ADA affiliate network of the Urban League movement nationally and is one of the oldest organizations in the United States. It was also recently recognized for the restoration of the now named Huntington Empowerment Center, which offers services to the community, including My Brother's Closet, the Minority Business Assistance Center, and also a new STEM learning lab. And lastly, on August 1st through the 4th, of this year, the Columbus Urban League will host the 2018 National Urban League Conference, which we are proud to host here. Um, if there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I would move for adoption. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Thank you, and Vice President Hurst, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Council Member Page. My name is Arthur Hurst. Again, I'm Vice President and Chief of Program Performance and Innovation for the Columbus Urban League. On behalf of our President and CEO, Stephanie Hightower, and the board and staff of your Columbus Urban League, thank you, Council Member Page, Council President Harden, and all council members and staff for this great honor. For 100 years, the Columbus Urban League has not wavered. We remain steadfast in our commitment to create hope and opportunity for the nearly 7,000 families we touch every year. We proudly offer an authentic, integrated, and an innovative system of services through 21 different initiatives across every neighborhood in Columbus and Franklin County. This work strengthens families, overcomes barriers, achieves economic mobility, and teaches children critical academic and life skills. We know life in poverty isn't a crisis. It is a, a seemingly incessant series of crises. That's why we try to cut through the bureaucracy and wrap around entire families with a continuum of connections and services that work to achieve foundational education, economic transformation, and family stabilization. We deliver these services with people who share life experiences with the families that we serve. It's more cultural competence. It's real community connection. CUL continues to be as important to our community today as, one, as we were 100 years ago. Back then, people found themselves limited by Jim Crow laws and redlining practices. Today, those same red lines divide and confine people to poverty and a lack of opportunity. More than half of the black children in Columbus live in poverty. Black women are still five times more likely to be evicted. Columbus needs an urban league to be as relevant and effective entity, and we appreciate the partnership that we have developed with the city to assist that goal. Finally, in recognition of our great work and our being in the top 5% of all ADA Urban League affiliates, we were selected to host this year's National Urban League Conference August 1st through 4th, as, as Council Member Page has stated. I want to remind everyone to sign up now, hear from thought leaders such as Tarana Burke from Hashtag Me Too Movement and Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook. We're on track to bust attendance records for this event, already estimated 20,000 participants. Also, everyone should come to Community Day, Saturday, August 4th, at the Creative Columbus Convention Center from 1030 to 5. In addition to live entertainment, we will give away backpacks and school supplies for kids, free haircuts, nail painting, and a host of other wonderful gifts, including health screenings. Please go to CUL.org for more information about the conference and our agency. And again, thank you for this tremendous honor. Thank you so much, Vice President Hurst. Again, are there any comments? Seeing none, congratulations, and we're looking forward to the conference. Thank you again.
President Pro Tem Cinziano. Thank you, President Harden. At this time, I'd like to invite Chaz Kaplan and Michael Galicchio, organizers of the Columbus Food Truck Festival, to the podium as I introduce Resolution 0227X-2018 from the floor to recognize and honor the Columbus Food Truck Festival on their eighth annual festival. So as the title alludes to, this will be the eighth annual Food Truck Festival and has truly become one of the staples of what we know as Columbus being the festival city uh, and truly a premier downtown event. Chaz and Mike, owners of the festival, are local businessmen and have been residents of the city of Columbus for most of their lives. The Food Truck Festival supports more than 100 local businesses and restaurants each year as well as local hotels and other establishments. With more than 40,000 people in attendance, the Columbus Food Truck Festival promotes local tourism, bringing in people from all across the region to our city. The festival has helped also to raise over 40,000 from local charities over the last seven years. So I'm looking forward to again attending the festival this year on Friday, August 17th, and Saturday, August 18th on the Scioto Mile. Chaz and Michael, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Council Member Stinziano, Council President uh, Hardin. Much appreciated. We're uh, excited to be here today and uh, accept this resolution. Uh, again, wanted to also thank uh, Mayor Ginther and and uh, the rest of the members of City Council today, uh, and not only supporting us in the festival, but supporting the hundred small business owners that are at the event and help to bring in revenue over a million dollars during the two-day process of our festival. It's quite a Quite a thing. Um, I was born in Cleveland. I've been in Columbus for over 25 years, and I'm proud to call it home. Uh, and it's even more amazing to have our festival right in the backyard on the Scioto Mile uh, at home with Mike. Um, another special thanks I wanted to throw out there, and, and I'm glad to see City Attorney Zach Klein here as well, uh, as when he was Council President, and John O'Grady, uh, County Commissioner and past Mayor Michael Coleman along with Mayor Ginther for supporting us all the way through this process and believing us from believing in us from the beginning of this process, mm -hmm. trusting us to throw another incredible event in our vibrant city and we're just we're just happy to accept it. Thank you. And by Any? the way, the Columbus Food Truck Festival is August seventeenth and eighteenth at the Scioto <laughs> Mile. And we hope all you guys will be there. Any questions, comments, or identifying your favorite food truck from my colleagues? Okay, there you go. <laughs> Seeing none, I'll move for adoption. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Thank you, President Stenziano, President Pro Tem, Councilmember Tyson. Thank you. Yes, I have one resolution, and I'm going to ask Don Sweet and Amy Allwood to walk towards the podium, please. And this resolution um, is to recognize August as Breastfeeding Awareness Month throughout the city of Columbus and to encourage all residents to support breastfeeding mothers and babies, whereas the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends and ex recommends exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life to provide the best possible start in life in all areas of human development. Whereas the health benefits of breast, breastfeeding for infants may include a reduced risk of obesity later in life, a reduced risk of sudden infant death syndrome, fewer ear and respiratory infections, a reduced risk of developing type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and an average increase of six points in IQ at age six and a half. And whereas mothers who receive benefits from exclusive breastfeeding the last, that last for life, specifically the longer mothers breastfed, the lower the BMI, blood pressure, waist circumference, DL, D, DL, LDL, I'm sorry, cholesterol, risk of type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and risk of depression. Whereas a 2010 study published in pediatrics found that if 90% of new mothers breastfed, the United States would save $13 billion per year in health care in healthcare costs and may prevent more than 90 deaths. <coughs> Whereas despite the aforementioned benefits in a 2014 Center for Disease Control breastfeeding report card found that only 70% of babies in Ohio are fed any breast milk and only 22 of these babies, 22% of these babies are breastfed exclusively for six months, which is recommended. Whereas the Surgeon General of the United States has issued a call to action to support breastfeeding, which focuses on the need for communities to increase societal support for breastfeeding. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus, this council does hereby recognize August as Breastfeeding Awareness Month in the City of Columbus and encourages all members of the community to enact policies that support 
breastfeeding mothers and babies. And um, I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Thank you. Thank you. And this is co-sponsored by Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. You make some comments. Thank you so much, Councilmember Tyson. Um, I just finished pumping about 30 minutes ago. Um, I have a, a three and a half month old at home. And one thing I would just like to add to your comments, Councilmember Tyson, is how important it is specifically that employers support breastfeeding. Um, we all talk about the health benefits of breastfeeding, and um, it really seems to be something that's widely acknowledged. But to put into practice the ability for moms to actually um, breastfeed, you have to have employers. Um, large employers need, need only to follow the law on um, pumping stations, lactation rooms, but small employers, I hope, can find ways to do that too. And also, um, many women are forced to go back to work too soon after their baby is born. A quarter of women have to go back to work two weeks after their baby is born. And um, that rarely leads to an environment where um, a mother can continue to breastfeed if she only gets two weeks of um, uh, bonding at home and learning to breastfeed with the baby. So I appreciate what you're doing to raise awareness. And I, I think that in the same breath that we talk about the health benefits um, for mom and baby, we need to be putting it on all of us culturally, um, on employers to um, take a hard look at how we enable healthy families to be bred in our, um, in our own backyards. So thank you. And thank you, Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, Councilman Brown. And so Don and Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council uh, Member Grayson and Brown. And I'm happy to say that Columbus Public Health does have a pumping room. So we represent Columbus Public Health in the Franklin County WIC program, and we would like to thank you for your support of breastfeeding um, and all of its benefits that it provides to our families and to our babies. And I'm Amy Allwood. I coordinate Franklin County WIC's breastfeeding program. Um, as many are aware, the benefits of breastfeeding extend beyond the infant to the mother and to the family and to the healthcare system and also to the environment. When an infant is provided breast milk, she or he is protected from numerous acute and chronic diseases and from food insecurity, which impacts 41 million Americans, including 12 million children. The infant's mother also experiences health benefits as well as decreased absence from work. Um, she could save $800 to $1,200 per year by offering breast milk over artificial feeding methods. And she's also more likely to safely space the birth of her next child. Breastfeeding is cost-effective, environmentally friendly, sustainable, and a renewable method of feeding that plays an important role in the health of our population. I'm happy to accept this resolution. I believe public awareness of breastfeeding encourages mothers to breastfeed, and it increases support for our breastfeeding families. It reminds healthcare and lactation support providers to continue to protect, promote, and support breastfeeding and to strive toward meeting national goals for breastfeeding initiation, exclusivity, and duration. Whether a mother is feeding a preterm or full-term infant, a toddler, or donating her milk to nurture another person's infant, she is contributing to the positive impact that breastfeeding has on the health of our population, our economy, and our planet. Thank you. I want to thank you for your leadership and focusing on the importance of breastfeeding. And there was just a recent article that was in the Communicator News, which is a newspaper in Columbus, Ohio. And it really um, was focusing on the, all the countries that were gathered in Geneva for the United Nations Affiliated World Health Assembly. And a resolution was to be passed in regards to um, the importance of breastfeeding. And something as and that we would all think would either would pass pretty easily. I just want to share that um, the United States created an uproar about the importance of breastfeeding, and we're really more in support of um, using other pro using products, other you know products formula, as opposed to breastfeeding. Eventually, it was passed after a lot of countries were against it. But um, certainly, um, you know, who thinks who would do that? But the United States at that point was not for it. And um, after uh, another country that we all, another country finally said it would be okay to pass it, it was passed. So um, 
It is important that we understand the importance of, as you said, as, of breast milk, and that in, certainly in countries where, in poor countries where there's unsafe water supplies, it can, and you use pop, and use powdered infant formula, it can be very dangerous to the baby and to the mother. So as a country, we also, not only a city, but as a country, we need to understand hopefully the importance of, breast, of breastfeeding. So I thank you for your leadership. And if you want to read the article, again, it's in the July 12th uh, Communicator News. And it's pretty astounding to think that we would not as a country be supportive of breastfeeding. So thank you for your leadership. I move for adoption if I didn't do it already. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson and Councilmember uh, Brown. Tonight, I don't have any resolutions, but I would like to invite up uh, uh, Mr. Josh and Kimberly Bale and the fellows of IC Stars. Uh, if they would come forward, come to the podium. Uh, IC Stars provides rigorous technology-based workforce development and leadership training to adults. The 10 fellows that are here with us tonight have been learning information, technology, and leadership skills through team-based projects. Fellows worked on a range of projects during this intensive four month, five days a week, 12 hour a day training program, earning as much as a thousand hours of hands on practical IT and business experience. These fellows are about to conclude their training and will soon launch, in, launch into their careers in IT. I wanna congratulate uh, all of the fellows that are here tonight for getting through this intensive training. I had a chance to meet with uh, these folks, young folks uh, out in the hall before council and really um, inspired uh, by the, the work that they are doing, but also by their passion and their, um, their uh, sure uh, bet that they're gonna be uh, employed in the IT sector here in, in our community. Uh, each one of them I talked to said that this is a career change. This is a career pathway for them. Uh, and they uh, thank Kim and, and all those associated with IC Stars for pro providing the avenues uh, to make these uh, career changes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim to talk a little bit more about the program and introduce uh, the folks that are here in this class. Thank you, President Harding and the council members. Thank you for honoring our program at IC Stars Columbus. So for those who don't know much about IC Stars, it's an IT workforce and social enterprise. Um, we focus on serving underrepresented groups um, and training them on high impact technology careers, specifically in software development skills. Uh, like he said, it is harsh. It's 16 weeks, 12 hour days. Uh, the program originated in the Chicago area and Columbus has been its first expansion city so we've been around since 2016 and so this is our third cohort and we're so proud of them they will be graduating this Friday and they didn't know that they were being honored today we wanted to surprise them and, and let them know how important they really are to us in doing the work that they're doing we know there's $1,200 uh, 1200 unfulfilled technology jobs here locally that's unfulfilled um, not only we want to uh, fill the skills gap here but also diversity talent we know that is crucial that um, those of us who are unrepresented in the, in the technology field, that we have the ability to make sure that they get there. And so we are already proud. Some already have offers, and any other ones will get offers here lately. And so we're so proud of the work that they do. Um, Josh, you want to tell a little bit about the project that they're working on and that they completed? Uh, sure. So for this cycle, uh, Washington Prime Group was our, our corporate client. And uh, the class split up into project teams, and they built their own SQL Server database. Uh, they developed a, a scheduling app. Uh, each project team developed their own app successfully. Uh, and so it was, it was uh, no small feat. Uh, it was incredibly difficult. In the 12-hour days, they really, uh, they really felt like 12 hours. But uh, anyway, it's just a hugely talented group uh, across the board for, from an IT perspective from project managers to business analysts to, to tech analysts to programmers. Uh, so uh, congrats, you guys. 
would you, I, I think it's important. So the program's not over yet, but some folks have uh, offers on the table. Somebody accepted an offer uh, this week. Would Lacey come up and tell us about uh, the offer that she just accepted? So two weeks ago, I just accepted an offer for, um, I cover my meds as an account coordinator. Um, it'll be my step in the door um, to getting into the tech field. Um, at Cover My Meds because it was my top company that I wanted to work for. Um, but my main goal is to get into a development team. So that's awesome. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Any of my uh, colleagues have any comments? Well, congratulations, and we look forward to seeing you guys all uh, part of our thriving um, IT community here in Columbus. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any comments by our elected officials? I see city attorney, auditor, treasurer's office. Um, I see Judge Barrows is in the audience. How are you this evening? Good, good, good. Is Hilt is that Hilltop that's here? Oh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> are there um, any requests by members of council for the removal of ordinance or resolutions from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk. Clerk, call the roll, please. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hart. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading. Finance Committee Ordinance 1817 and Ordinance 2037-2018. Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 1983 and 1984-2018. Economic Development and Small Business Committee Ordinances 2185, 2186, 2187, 2188, 2189, 2190, 2191, 2192, 2193, 2194, 2195, and 2196-2018. Neighborhoods Committee Ordinances 1896 and 2019-2018. Technology Committee Ordinances 2140 and 2142-2018. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 1932, 1938, 1962, 1970, 2038-2066-2018. Rules and Reference Committee Ordinances 2184 and 2145-2018. Zoning Committee Ordinances 2022, 2029, 2030, 2041, 2042, 2072, 2082, 2097, and 2100-2018. Seeing no speakers on the uh, first reading agenda, uh, will the clerk now, uh, the following ordinance will appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those ordinance numbers into the record? Resolutions of Expression 228X, 230X-2018. Finance Committee Ordinances 1920, 1933, 1941, 1995, 2027, 2036, 2102 2018 Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinances 1906, 1907, 1961, 1966, and 1969-2018. Public Safety Committee Ordinances 1955, 1981-2018. Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 1662, 1849, 1850, 1862, 1871, 1877, 1918, 1937, 1942, 1967, 2003, 2012, 2016, and 2018 2018. Economic Development and Small Business Committee Resolution 213X 2018. Ordinances 1996, 1997, 2021, 2046, 2047 and 2076-2018 Housing Committee. Ordinances 2015, 2067, 2068, 2069-2018. Judiciary and Court Administration Committee Ordinances 1935, 1936-2018. Technology Committee Ordinances 1128, 1812, 1837, 1972, 2006, 2008, 2011, 2048, and 2155. 2018 Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 1792, 1825, 1842, 1866, 1879, 1915, 1934 2018 Health and Human Services Committee Ordinances 1270, 2162 2018, and 2166 2018 Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0207, 208, 209, 
210, 211, and 213-2018. We do have one speaker on the consent agenda, and that's Mr. Our Judge uh, Barrows. Your Honor, welcome to the uh, <laughs> welcome to council. I almost said chamber. <laughs> well, it is a chamber. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Um, I rise to speak on uh, um, agenda number 1935-2018. It's under Judiciary and Court Administration. I've just lost my name, but I'll stick it back up here. And I'm reflecting as I look here that I've been coming to council for a number of years, and Council Member Tyson is the one that I remember as being here the longest and maybe the only one that was here when I first started coming. And we've talked about work release a lot over the years. And I know that you've always looked at it as a positive. So I wanted to, for those of you that are newer to this, um, I wanted to give you a little idea about this. Work release is our last resort for people convicted of misdemeanors to send them off to jail. And none of us really likes doing that. There's some people that need to go to jail. There's some people who can't succeed on probation and other forms of community control. And now we have work release, which means that if I have no other choice but to send somebody to jail and they have a job, I can send them, instead of the jail, I can send them to Alvis, where they will spend the night, be drug tested, have access to um, AOD training and other, other things that would benefit them, and keep their job. So the immediate impact is that person. Continue working, and we confirm that they actually have employment. Nobody's just gonna come and say, I work for Uncle John. Um, that they're working, they're paying taxes, they're supporting their family, and they're paying their debt to society. So what's the value? Other than that person's, the value to the community is that the cost of putting that person up at Alvis House and the services they get at Alvis is about $18 or less per night than what we pay the county mm. to put them in the jail. So just having this in place is a cost savings to the city. Over and above the $18 a night is each of these prisoners pays 25% of their gross income into the fund so we can put even more people through this than the, than the actual per day cost. So we're saving money for the city just from scratch. Now, we handle city charges and we handle state code charges. And the city challenged us several years ago saying, well, is the money that we're putting into this going to support prisoners that are convicted under city code? Good question. We went to, uh, we got a grant from DRC to pay for state code prisoners. And we have used city code money, uh, money from this council to support city code prisoners and generate those cost savings. Um, we have had to come back about every couple of years and ask to have the fund replenished. Uh, the ordinance that you are passing this evening authorizes the expenditure of the money that the county paid in for this program because the DRC quit funding it. And the county, who's already paying a fixed cost to the sheriff to have the jail, sees the value of this program. And they're putting in money that's not getting the kind of return that you're getting. They're paying the fixed cost of the jail. The only thing they're saving is the cost of the meals for somebody who's at Alva's house and eating at home instead of being in the jail. But they're kicking in their 100,000, and that's what this ordinance does. It releases to the court, to Alvis, the $100,000 that they put in. Now, Councilmember Page knows, and several of others have seen my emails where I'm trying to get the city to kick in because we're out of money for city code offenses. And I don't want to have to report when somebody asks. I don't want to have to tell the judges, you can't send people on city code uh, cases to Alvis House anymore for work release. They got to go to jail. The city will pay more for each of those prisoners when they get the bill from the sheriff than they would pay for this. And I've been unable to get this council to shake loose the money to get this done. We've been trying to do it for a while. I will also put Mr. Lombardi on the hot seat because I've been trying for three years to get the finance department to put this funding from the city into our budget for the court. So I don't have to come, I'm happy to come back and report success. I don't like coming back and begging y'all for money. But because we can't get it into our budget, this is what we do. So I'm looking for help on that issue. I absolutely support this ordinance. The money is there to be spent for this purpose and is what it ought to happen. But y'all ought to be looking deeper to find the money to fund the city code cases for the rest of this year, which is what we're asking for. And you ought to be putting pressure on the executive branch to put it into our budget so we don't have to have this discussion over and over again. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry if I'm a little emotional about this. I am angry. Um, but I'll try to calm down and answer any questions that any of you may have, especially the newcomers who may not know very much about this, Mr. Ramey. Thank you, Judge Barrows. Are there any questions or comments for the judge? For my colleagues, 
we look forward to, to having further conversations offline. Thank you, Council President Harden. Uh, seeing no uh, more questions or comments on the consent agenda, may I have a motion for approval of these items designated as consent action by, uh, by voice? I apologize. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll by voice, please. Ms. Brown? Yes, with the exception of 2016-2018, on which I'm abstaining. <coughs> Mr. Brown? Yes. Page? Yes. Remy? Yes. Stenziano? Yes. Tyson? Yes, with the exception of 1935-2018 and 1936-2018, on which I am abstaining. President Hardin. Yes, consent action items are passed with the noted exceptions. We will now proceed with the second reading of 30-day and tabled, legis tabled and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance Committee. Council Member Liz Elizabeth Brown chairs that committee. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight in finance, we have Ordinance 1993-2018 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer $1,130,500 between projects within the safety voted bond fund and safety taxable uh, voted bond fund and $65,000 between projects within the recreation and parks voted bond fund to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with Gutnick Construction Company for construction of Police Substation 1 to authorize the expenditure of $7,030,500 from the Safety Voted Bond Fund to authorize the expenditure of $100,000 from the Safety Taxable Voted Bond Fund to authorize the expenditure of $192,500 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund, to authorize the expenditure of $65,000 from the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund, and to declare an emergency. Police Substation 1 will be located at 8118 Sankis Boulevard in Far North Columbus and will allow the Division of Police to better serve the Far North community. The design is for a 12,200 square foot building that is LEED certified and includes a space for community gatherings. As the title indicates, the construction of this station is made possible by the voted bond funds supported by Columbus residents. This project represents those dollars at work, so thank you to the voters for their ongoing support of bond issues when they are on the ballot. Emergency action is being considered so that the project may begin as soon as practical during the 2018 construction season. The expected opening of the substation is the third quarter of 20. 20. Any questions for my colleagues? I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have Ordinance 1994-2018 to amend the 2018 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate funds within the Special Income Tax Fund and the Wagoner Road TIF Capital Fund to authorize the transfer of funds between projects within the Wagoner Road TIF Capital Fund, to authorize the transfer of funds between the Special Income Tax Fund and the Safety Voted Bond Fund, to authorize the transfer of funds between projects within the Safety Voted Bond Fund, to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with Elford Incorporated for construction of Fire Station 35, to authorize the expenditure of $7,073,000 from the Safety Voted Bond Fund, to authorize the expenditure of $3,500,000 from the Wagoner TIF Capital Fund, and to declare an emergency. This is another example of voted bond funds being used to construct Fire Station Number 35 at 711 North Wagoner Road in Far East Columbus. Thank you again to the voters for supporting these bond issues. The design is for a 26,750 square foot building that is LEED certified and includes additional safety features for first responders. This is an important component of the design to help keep our firefighters safe and healthy on the job. The new station will allow the Division of Fire to better serve the Far East Columbus community. We heard a lot from them about this project at our um, neighborhood hearing in the, on the east side during the capital budget process. It is also important to highlight that the city entered into a first-of-its-kind community benefit agreement with the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council for this project. 
The CBA establishes that all awarded contracts for Fire Station 35 will utilize highly skilled local workers. Everyone on the job will be paid prevailing wages. The agreement also establishes that training opportunities will be provided through the project for Columbus residents to enter into good paying construction careers, especially those in historically underserved areas. Emergency action is being considered so that work on the station may begin as soon as practical during the 2018 construction season with expected opening the, uh, of the third quarter of 2020. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have Ordinance 2099-2018 to authorize the issuance and sale of special assessment bonds in the amount of $32,709 for the Broad Meadows Highfield Drive area street light assessment project. Residential street lighting projects are prioritized by the city based on public safety and activity considerations. Once a project has been selected, residents are contacted within the project boundary to solicit feedback. Under normal circumstances, the city installs conventional street lights on wood poles. However, residents are given the opportunity to consider the installation of decorative lights. Property owners in the Broad Meadows Highfield Drive area submitted a petition to the city for the installation of decorative street lights through this process. In doing so, they agreed to self-assess their own properties to cover the cost of the lights beyond what the city would normally pay. This ordinance authorizes the issuance of bonds to cover the cost of the project to be repaid by the assessment on the impacted properties. For residents who are interested in this process, you can always contact the Street Lighting Engineering Section of the Division of Power by calling 614-645-1509 for more information. I would like to uh, first request to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waive. And I'd like to move uh, for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you, President Hardin, that's all I have. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before council is the Public Safety Committee. Councilmember Mitch Brown chairs that committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Tonight, I have Ordinance 2034-218 to authorize the finance and management director into a consulting agreement with Matrix Consulting Group for an operations review of the Department of Public Safety to authorize the transfer of 300,000 between the divisions within the general fund to authorize the expenditure of 300,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. This commission will work with the mayor's existing community safety advisory commission and focus on areas such as de-escalation, crisis intervention, and implicit bias training use of force policies, diversity recruitment, and retention, and early intervention in officer wellness programs. Uh, at this time, Director Lombardi, do you have any additional comments? Thank you, President Hardin, Council Member Mitch Brown, other members of Council. Um, this operational review is, is not your standard operational review. Uh, we opened RFPs on May 10th. We received seven proposals. There was a committee of five that included representatives from the mayor's office, office, uh, the Public Safety Department, and Janet Jackson, our former city attorney, who is also chair of the Safety Commission. Those were uh, narrowed down to three finalists, and after review of all the proposals, Matrix was uh, scored uh, highest by all five members. Um, they do have experience of over 350 studies from various municipality sizes, from the same size as Columbus, as large as Chicago. Uh, they also have a very good reputation with their recommendations and implementation of some of those recommendations. And they just recently completed a study for the city of Austin. Um, as you indicated, council member, uh, we will look at community policing strategies. Um, we will support the work of the Community Safety Advisory Commission. We'll also look at juvenile policing and then we'll benchmark against best practices that we uh, that they see out in other communities. Uh, if there are no further questions, that's all I have for this evening. Uh, Director Lombardi, when do you anticipate this project being completed? Uh, we believe that the timeline will be about nine months before we see the first draft of recommendations. And will you share that with this council, please? I'm sorry? I said, will you share that with this council once it's completed? We will. Thank you. If there are no additional questions, I move for passage. Please call the roll. 
Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Also, uh, ordinance 2151 2018 to authorize the public safety director to enter into a contract with SST Inc. doing business as Shot Spotter to establish a gunfire detection alert and analysis pilot program to waive the competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Code Chapter 329 to authorize the transfer of $685,000 between departments within the journal fund to authorize the expenditure of $685,000 from the journal fund and to declare an emergency. A gunfire detection system detects and conveys the location of gunfire using acoustics, optics, and other kinds of sensors with notifications to the communication center and to expedite response to gunfire by law enforcement. Assistant Director Collins, please share with us the need to waive competitive bidding on this pilot project, please. Thank you, President Hardin, Safety Chair Brown, and other council members. Um, the department intends to deploy the technology commonly known as ShotSpotter, a subscription-based service that involves installation of gunfire sensor network detectors in areas identified by the city. These sensors connect to a cloud-based data in center infrastructure, providing 24-7, 365 gunfire monitoring service within a three-mile square um, radius of the installed infrastructure that's put in. In addition to gunfire detection, it will also notify law enforcement agencies of the gunfire incidents and direct them to the precise location that the call is picked up at. The service also offers the capability to instantly notify officers of shootings in progress with real-time data delivered to dispatch officers, patrols, and smartphones. The alerts are intended to improve police response to incidents of gunfire, enhance officer safety, speed aid to victims, assist in investigations and the collection of evidence, and ultimately the apprehension of dangerous offenders. The data collected from this system can also be used to prevent future crimes by informing law enforcement of prospective locations where gun-related crimes are most likely to occur. Agencies that have adopted shop spotter technology as part of a comprehensive crime, crime, reduction, crime reduction strategy have reported reductions in urban gunfire by up, by up to 80 percent and related violent crime by as much as 40 percent. The gunfire detection system can also be integrated with existing city technology infrastructure to capture, layer, and share data across platforms. We're seeking to ask for a one-year pilot program to assess the effectiveness of the technology and to measure how the system may um, assist law enforcement and improve response to incidents of gunfire. It will, um, the results of the pilot will inform decisions related to future contracting of similar services. The pilot phase anticipates the installation of the technology in the areas including Hilltop, Linden, and Southside neighborhoods, the continuation of this initiative, and any potential expansion into additional neighborhoods will be considered based upon the review and overall effectiveness of the pilot program. Uh, we are asking to waive competitive bidding provisions um, as ShotSpotter has the necessary skills, experience, and technology platform to ensure that the pilot program is implemented quickly and successfully, SST Incorporated is currently working with the City of Cincinnati to implement a similar gunfire detection infrastructure. Experience working successfully with another Ohio municipality helped inform the decision to initiate a pilot program with SST, and we intend to build off of that. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Director Collins, are you going to be communicating with those respective neighborhoods so they understand and will they play a part in the implementation of this pilot project? Uh, there is a two-pronged part of this. Yes, there will be some communication, but we don't want to let the bad guys know too much. Um, but we will let neighborhoods know that those shot spotter detection sensors are in their neighborhood. If there are no comments from my colleague, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Dreamy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Uh, President Hardin, if that's all I have in public safety, may I move on to rules of reference? Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, in rules of reference, we have 2028-2018 uh, to amend Chapter 597 of the Columbus City Code's alarm user license and alarm dealer license in order to provide for the administration of that chapter by the Division of Support Services within the Department of Public Safety and to declare an emergency. This amendment will allow additional personnel from the Division of Support Services to administer the alarm license process. If there are no questions, I move for passage. 
Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. Pass. Also, I have 2043-2018, Ordinance 243-2018 to amend sections 525.01 and 525.24 and repeal section 525.23 of the Columbus City Codes in order to allow all nonprofit entities to apply for a permit to engage in distribution in the roadway. This legislation amends the city code governing applications for charitable organizations to solicit not-for-profit contributions in the right-of-way for one 24-hour period annually. Permits to solicit charitable contributions in the roadway have been required since 2008, but were only available to organizations with 501c3 designation. This ordinance expands those eligible to apply for a permit to individuals or organizations regardless of affiliation to a 501c3. The safety requirements of the original permitting process will not change with this amendment and it is our priority to ensure the safety of the distributors and our drivers. Uh, City Attorney, do you have any comments, sir, with regards to this legislation? I, you summed it up brilliantly. Uh, I'm sorry, Council President Hardin, Chair Brown, members of Council. Uh, you summed it up brilliantly in your explanation. This amendment uh, does expand beyond uh, the typical charitable organizations or 501c3 status and does allow uh, any not-for-profit organization or individual acting in a not-for-profit capacity uh, to apply for one of these permits uh, for a 24-hour period uh, to be in the right-of-way uh, to perform work that is not-for-profit in nature. I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you, City Attorney. Again, the objective is to address the concerns of safety. There are some additional changes that have been made. One uh, specifically is that individuals will have to wear uh, reflective vests and they will have to notify all the appropriate locations of where they will be uh, uh, distributing uh, for uh, contributions. If there are no further questions, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. That's all I had to see from President Hardin. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before Council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Councilmember Emmanuel Remy chairs that committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Hardin. Tonight I have Ordinance Number 1655, 2018, to amend the 2018 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize this the, to authorize and direct the city auditor to appropriate funds within the special income tax fund, to transfer funds between the special income tax fund and streets and highways bond fund, to transfer funds within the streets and highways bond fund, and within the water bonds fund, to authorize the director of public service to enter into contract with the Strasser Paving Company for resurfacing 2018 Project 2, to authorize the expenditure of up to $9,521,491.48 to pay for the project and to declare an emergency. This contract includes repairing and resurfacing 55 city streets and constructs 353 ADA curb ramps along those streets. The work consists of milling the existing pavement, overlaying with new asphalt, concrete, minor curb replacement, and replacing curb and sidewalk associated with installing ADA wheelchair ramps. Where warranted, the plans also call for areas of full depth pavement repair. Specific work areas are identified for roadway, base, cement stabilization, and pavement reconstruction. All of this information is available online. I have nothing further on this one. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 1841, 2018, to appropriate funds within the Rocky Fork TIF Fund to authorize the transfer of tra cash and appropriation from the Rocky Fork Fort TIF Fund to fund 7241 Rocky Fork TIF Capital Fund, Old Hamilton Road Improvement Project to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with the Double Z Construction Company for the Old Hamilton Road Improvements Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $2,202,465.53 for the Old Hamilton Road Improvements Project and to declare an emergency. This contract includes roadway improvements to Old Hamilton, currently Hamilton Road, from Roundabout Boulevard to Dublin-Granville Road and Dublin-Granville Road from approximately 600 feet west of Old Hamilton to Old Old Hamilton. Old Hamilton will be widened and resurfaced and Dublin Granville Road will be reconstructed. Additional improvements include sidewalk, shared use path and intersection, upgrades, streetscape improvements, new stormwater, stormwater basin, street lighting and other work as may be necessary to complete the contract in accordance with the plans and specifications set forth in the bid submittal documents. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? 
Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance number 1863-2018 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to transfer funds within the New Albany West Central College TIF Fund to appropriate funds within the New Albany West Central College TIF Fund and the Street and Highway Non-Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Double Z Construction Company for the Roadway Lifestyle New Albany Road Ablongabout Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $811,840.18 from the New Albany West Central College TIF Fund and up to $2,104,690.58 from the Street and Highway a non-bond fund for the project and to declare an emergency. This project involves reconstructing, reconstructing New Albany Road West from Central College Road to Churchill Downs Drive in association with the surrounding development. The curb line will be relocated to accommodate lane configuration changes as well as a combination of diagonal and parallel parking. An oblong shaped roundabout oblong about, will be installed between Central College Road and Churchill Downs Drive. Sidewalk will be installed on both sides. Street trees and landscaping will be installed throughout the project limits. Stormwater and street lighting systems relocations modifications will also be done. Yes, Councilmember Brown. I'm a little slow. Someone explain to me an oblong about. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Director Gallagher, could you expound on that, please? <laughs> President Hardin, other members of council, it's just a roundabout that has been elongated. Think it's, oval. How's that for technical? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you very much. Next, I have ordinance number 1913-2018 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to appropriate funds within the special income tax fund in the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the transfer of funds between the special income tax fund and the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the transfer of funds within the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the director of public service to enter into contract with Kakosing Construction Company for the resurfacing 2018 Project 3 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $12,322,000 within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. This contract repairs and resurfaces 88 city streets, constructs 512 ADA curb ramps along those streets and other work as may be deemed necessary to complete the project in accordance with the plans and specifications set forth in the bid submittal documents. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance number 1919-2018 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the transfer of funds within the water bonds fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Truco Construction Company for the Poindexter Village Roadways Phase 3 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $88,254.24 from the Water Bonds Fund and up to $2,492,731.22 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund for the Poindexter Village Roadways Phase 3 project and to declare an emergency. This contract consists of one roadway reconstruction with extension of one existing roadway and resurfacing of four streets. Improvements will consist of storm sewer, sanitary sewer, water main sidewalks, uh, water, water main sidewalks, brick repair, shared use path, street lighting, street trees, associated, uh, associated say, I can't even speak anymore, associated with the Poindexter Village Redevelopment Project. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have um, 1921-2018 to authorize the director of 
Okay. The Department of Public Service to execute those documents required to transfer a portion of the unnamed east-west right-of-way south of Lafayette Street between North 5th and Nielsen Street and a portion of the unnamed north-south right-of-way between Lafayette and Long Streets to Chavez Long Street investors and for the city to receive $60,765 as consideration for the transfers. First, I'd like to amend to emergency. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Amend it. If there's no other questions, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Finally, this evening, I have ordinance number 1951-2018 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the dire and direct the city auditor to appropriate funds within the special income tax fund and within the streets and highways bond fund to transfer funds from the special income tax fund to the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the director of finance and management to enter into contracts on behalf of the Department of Public Service for the purchase of steel necessary for the completion of the State Route 315 at North Broadway Interchange Project 2 to authorize the expenditure of up to 1600000 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund for that purchase and to declare an emergency. This, the aforementioned project, which is the second phase of improvements to the interchange at State Route 315 West North Broadway and Olentangy River Road, encompasses the construction of a new bridge carrying State Route 315 over a new southbound ramp to West North Broadway and various improvements to the State Route 315 northbound exit to West North Broadway. The intersection of the Olentangy River Road and Thomas Lane State Route 315 southbound exit ramp in the intersection of West North Broadway and the driveway to Riverside Methodist hospital. I would like to ask Director Gallagher to speak to this ordinance. President Hardin, Chair Remy, other members of council, the reason that we're coming before you this evening for this is the steel needed for this project must be delivered by February of 2019 so the newly constructed ramp can open to traffic in May of 2019. We are going to be going to bid for this project in October of 2018 not awarding it till November, which would only give us about two months to get that steel in. And currently right now in the country, steel is at a premium and it's taking us up to eight months to get the steel in for projects. And so to be able to meet the timelines to keep this project moving and get traffic back open to the residents we want to go <coughs> and purchase the steel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. And that's all I have in public service. Thank you, Chair Remy. The next committee to come before council is the Economic and Small Business Development Committee. Council Member Jiza Page, Chairs. Council Member Floor George. Thank you, President Hardin. This evening in Economic Development and Small Business, we have Ordinance 1948-2018 to authorize the Director of Development to enter into an Enterprise Zone Agreement with OBM Headquarters LLC, FDP Investments 1 LLC, and FDP Investments 2 LLC, collectively the owner, and Cover My Meds LLC, the future office tenant, for a property tax abatement of 100% for a period of 15 consecutive years on real property improvements in consideration of a proposed total investment of approximately $225 million in new building and garage construction, the retention and relocation of approximately 592 existing full-time permanent employment positions, the creation of approximately 1,032 net new full-time permanent employment positions within the next five years, and to authorize the Director of Development to enter into a compensation agreement with the Columbus City School District, Cover My Meds LLC, and the owner pursuant to this project. I would first like to ask the director to offer additional comments. Thank you, Chair Page, uh, President Hardin, members of council. Um, this piece of legislation and the companion piece, sorry, that are, um, that's coming up next for our jobs growth incentive are two pieces of legislation to move forward. What is um, probably one of the biggest uh, investments that we've seen in the urban core uh, from a local company, not nationwide insurance, in um, decades. And it is for a project that is in um, West Franklinton, 
Uh, we see this as a fantastic opportunity to support really one of our homegrown success stories here in Columbus. Cover My Meds is a company that was founded here in Columbus by Matt Scantlin. Um, he's grown the company from a fantastic idea into uh, a business that has attracted attention nationally, has attracted investment nationally, um, was recently purchased by um, McKesson Corporation, and that purchase is allowing him to really take the business to the next level. Um, this is something that we in the administration have been working on for, uh, I think, pushing a year now. Um, have gone through lots of work to make sure that we, number one, first sold uh, the city of Columbus as the place where Cover My Meds wanted to remain and grow. Um, and second, really focused on finding the right location for Cover My Meds and spent a lot of time listening um, to the folks from Cover My Meds and their team and understanding the environment that they wanted. And um, we worked with them and a number of folks to really work to make sure that we had a site that would work for the company. We're very, very excited to move forward. Um, this is something that will generate um, great benefit to the city. It will generate great benefit to the schools. The Columbus City Schools um, have negotiated a compensation agreement uh, with um, Cover My Meds and their development team that Cover My Meds will be making substantial investments into the schools. Uh, we have a revenue sharing agreement with the schools that is part of this. Um, uh, the school board voted on this on 29th of last month. So we're really looking forward to taking this last step from the city's perspective. I would um, let the members know that there are a couple of additional steps that need to happen. One is that the Ohio Tax Credit Authority is taking uh, this up, I think, on Monday next Monday um, for their consideration and um, uh, the folks from Cover My Meds need to take it to the corporate board at McKesson and um, they need to cross that hurdle as well. But we're looking forward to continue to work forward to bring uh, these jobs to Columbus and to Franklinton. Thank you, Director. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for, I'm sorry, we do have a speaker this evening speaking against this ordinance, so I will um, hold on the request for a vote. And that is Mr. Joe Motil. Again, welcome to council. Mr. Motil, you have three minutes. President Harden, members of city council, uh, thank you. I will once again remind you that Cover My Meds is, as was stated, owned by the McKesson Corporation, which is one of the nation's three largest distributors of pharmaceuticals, including opioid drugs, which reported revenues of $200 billion in 2017 and is the sixth wealthiest company in the world. With that much wealth, why does a company need any type of financial assistance from any level of government in order to continue being immersed in cash? would appear to me greed and shamelessness come to mind. And you will undoubtedly cave in once again this evening to another Fortune 500 company by giving them a tax savings of nearly $77 million. And this has to be one of the most obscene and settling tax abatement requests to ever enter this chamber. McKesson can also lay claim to its horrendous reputation for being one of the worst offenders of pill dumping, which has helped fuel our country's opioid epidemic and allegedly right here in Columbus. The pill dumping had been going around since 2007 for the sole sake of increasing profits at the expense of killing people and all the other social, criminal, and economic ramifications tied into the opioid epidemic. They've even went so far as to reward their CEO $692 million from 2007 to 2017 for this murderous activity. So now Columbus can boast having the presence of the top three pill dumping pharmaceuticals in its city and between the three of these wonderful, caring, multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical corporations, they've dumped nearly nine million hydrocodone pills over the last two years in a single pharmacy in the town of Kermit, West Virginia, that has a population of less than 400 people. And in 2007, McKesson also sent 3,289,000 doses of hydrocodone into Mingo County, West Virginia, which was the equivalent of 124 pills for every man, woman, and child that lives in that county. And all this contributed to placing West Virginia with the highest overdose mortality rate in the nation. 
just what Columbus needs, another billion dollar corporation who believes that the tax taxpayers of the world owe them something for being job creators. And in this case, a filthy rich billion dollar corporation that sat by and watched tens of thousands of human lives being taken and their families destroyed for the sake of making money for themselves and their stockholders. And as far as I'm concerned, if you grant this tax abatement or give them a penny's worth of incentives, you too are as guilty as they are for contributing millions of tax dollars to a callous corporation where human lives and dollar signs are all in the same. Or does $52,500 worth of campaign contributions from Cover My Meds employees to Mayor Ginther take precedence over the financial hardships and lives of working families? There's no trickle-down economics in this city for these tax abatements. On the contrary, I think it helps perpetuate our city's status as the number two most economically segregated city in America. And really, the, the sixth wealthiest company on the planet doesn't need a tax abatement. And when this is passed this evening, you will have approved this council just over $257 million in tax <coughs> abatements over the past 33 months. Thank you. Excuse me. There, can we please have order in this chamber? Can we please have order in the chamber? Council member. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Motil. Are there any additional questions or comments from my colleagues? President Hardin. Thank you, Chair Page. I just go back to the resolution period of this uh, council meeting when we had Lacey um, from Icy Stars, and I remember of John um, and Farah and all these other young people who are training for jobs, IT jobs in our community. At the end of the day, this is what this is about. It's about uh, continuing to grow uh, a home-built company uh, and making sure that they stay here in Columbus and provide access and opportunity for our young people. And so uh, I just want to thank you for your leadership uh, in steering this through um, in the conversations that, that we've had. And thank you to the, direct, the Department of Public uh, Development uh, for your work on this uh, piece of legislation. Thank you, President Hardin. If there are no further questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please follow up. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Ordinance 1949-2018 to authorize the Director of Development to enter into a dual rate <laughs> jobs growth incentive with Cover My Meds LLC for a term of up to eight consecutive years in consideration of a total investment of approximately $240 million, the retention and relocation of approximately 592 existing full-time permanent employment positions, and the creation of approximately 1,032 net new full-time permanent employment positions by December 31st, 2022. As the director stated, this is the companion piece. And if there are no questions or comments, I would first move to request to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Uh, amended. And I request for a passage as amended. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. 1978-2018, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Brownfield Grant Agreement with Columbus Urban League to complete asbestos remediation and selective demolition on the site pursuant to the Green Columbus Fund Program to authorize the expenditure of up to $24,835 from the Northland and other acquisitions fund and to declare an emergency. There are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. And my last three pieces are all around the work that the Department of Development has done with their small businesses and their small business concierge and just really continuing to encourage the growth of small businesses and taking a look at the work that they were doing. Uh, Director, do you have any comments before we move into those? Uh, thank you, Chair Page, uh, members of council. Yeah, this is, uh, we went through, we've been going through a process of re-examining our small business programming. And this year we decided to do things a little bit differently and put out for bid to um, organizations around the city the opportunity to put forward programs that they thought could assist us in reaching more small businesses and doing a better job of providing them with the services that, they've, that they need. 
So uh, we had a number of folks apply for funding uh, in the first round of this process. We uh, selected three organizations, um, some of which we've worked with in the past, some of which are new to us, to provide services to small businesses from around the city to help them either get off the ground or um, <clears throat> accelerate their growth. We anticipate coming back to this body um, later in the year or early next year with another round where we'll be looking for opportunities to work with organizations that are going to help us find the next small business. Uh, who will help us reach into communities where we maybe are not doing as good a job as we should have at find as we should be doing at finding businesses. So this is uh, the first phase for us. We look forward to working on this. I would also be remiss if I did not thank Andrew Dyer from Council for working through uh, the review process with us. Andrew was a valued member of the team and provided us some great insight through the process. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Director. Our first ordinance is 1985-2018 to authorize the expenditure of $100,000 from the 2018 Community Development Block Grant Fund to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into contract with your management team in support of the Small Business and Entrepreneur Support Pilot Program and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. 1986-2018. To authorize the expenditure of $50,000 from the 2018 Division of Economic Development General Fund budget to authorize the expenditure of $50,000 from the 2018 Community Development Block Grant Fund to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into contract with Columbus State Community College and to declare an emergency. There are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. 1987-2018, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into contract with Rev1 Ventures Incorporated, to authorize the expenditure of $50,000 from the Division of Economic Development's 2018 General Fund budget and to declare an emergency. There are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. And that's all we have in economic development and small business this evening. Thank you, Chair Page. The next committee to come before council is the Public Utilities uh, Committee. Councilmember Cinziano chairs that committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight in Public Utilities, we have two ordinances. The first is Ordinance 1895-2018 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to renew an existing engineering services agreement with emh and Incorporated for the Black Lick Sanitary Intercept Sewer Section 6 Parts B and C to authorize the transfer within an expenditure of up to $1,122,657 and seven cents from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2018 capital improvements budget. This tunnel project will construct a new gravity sanitary sewer, which will provide service to rapidly expanding areas in and around the city. Additional customers will keep additional customers will keep sewer rates low, and the gravity sewer will allow for eventual elimination of redundant pump stations, thereby lowering operation costs. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next ordinance is 1953-2018 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with BLD Services, LLC, for the roof redirection Clintonville 1, Morse Dominion Project and lateral lining Clintonville 1, Morse Dominion Project to authorize the appropriation and transfer of $3,127,747.70 from the Sanitary Sewer Reserve Fund to the Ohio Water Development Loan Fund to authorize the transfer within and the expenditure of up to $3,124,340.51 Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund for a total combination, combined expenditure of $6,252,088.21 and to amend the 2018 capital improvements budget and declare an emergency. The project is needed to mitigate water and basement events and sanitary sewer overflows. The work consists of redirecting downspouts from home to discharge the street and lining approximately 475 sanitary sewer laterals via cured in place pipe technology. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, nothing about cured in place pipe technology, Councilmember Brown? You know that one. You know that one. Uh, seeing none, I'll move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. That's all I have in utilities this evening. Thank you, Chair Sinziano. 
Uh, the next committee to come before council is the Health and Human Services Committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs that committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have Ordinance 1928-2018 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Health for the Tobacco Use Prevention Cessation <laughs> Grant Program in the amount of $67,000 to authorize the appropriation of $67,000 to the Health Department in the Health Department Grant Fund and to declare an emergency. We know that tobacco use is a contributing factor to four out of the five leading causes of death in many of our neighborhoods. And so this grant will address youth prevention and policy development addressing smoke-free living with the goal of reducing chronic diseases. The tobacco grant will be utilized to educate Columbus residents about the dangers of smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke, as well as the prevalence of targeted marketing to youth. The Columbus Public Health Tobacco Program Manager will work with the community, community partners to identify possible secondhand smoke and youth initiation policy targets. Media campaigns will be developed and promoted to inform the dangers of secondhand smoke and youth initiation, therefore reducing exposure and youth initiation. Technical assistance will be, will be provided to our community members and organizations to develop and implement tobacco policy. For more information, please contact Katie Stone at klstone at columbus.gov or 614-645-3173. There are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. I think the next ordinance is 2044-2018 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Commission on Minority Health for the Minority Health Grant Program in the amount of $52,500 to authorize the appropriation of $52,500 to the Health Department and the Health Department's Grants Fund and to declare an emergency. The Minority Health Grant Program enables Columbus Public Health to work to eliminate differences in health status between racial and ethnic minority and non-minority populations by providing leadership and guidance on the best ways to address racial and, eth and ethnic health disparity and specific health needs of racial and ethnic minority groups. The Office of Minority Health focuses on four core competencies um, to monitor and report the health st status <coughs> excuse me, of minority populations, inform, educate, and empower people, mobilize community partnerships, and develop, develop policies and plans. There are nearly 50 stakeholders who serve with the Minority Health Advisory Committee throughout the city of Columbus, and they meet six times a year. In 2017, um, with this grant funding and other dollars through Columbus Public Health, they served over 656 organizations and provided services to 23,000 residents. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Dreamy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Fast. Thank you. The last ordinance I have in my committee this evening, I'm going to ask um, Tiffany Wright to please walk to the podium. She is representing um, Hands On Central Ohio. She is a senior director and senior director of finance and grant administration. This ordinance. Ordinance 2050-2018 is to approve the grant application of Hands on Central Ohio seeking financial assistance to address emergency health, emergency human service needs pursuant to Columbus City Code to authorize expenditure of $30,000 from the Emergency Human Services Fund and to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $30,000 within the Neighborhood Initiative Subfund to authorize the Director of Development to execute a grant agreement with Hands on Central Ohio to provide any time access to emergency food for Columbus residents through fully automated and a in a, in interactive health and AI chat channels and to declare an emergency. Ms. Tiffany, could you please, Ms. Wright, could you please ex, um, share um, the particulars of this particular initiative? Thank you. Thank you, Council President Hardin, Council Member Tyson, and other members of council. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before you today. As stated, I am Tiffany Wright, here to speak on behalf of Hands On Central Ohio. First, I'd like to thank the Council for its longstanding support of Hands-On Central Ohio and its partnership in developing innovative solutions that expand access to emergency food. The legislation being considered today, 2050-2018 for $60,000, completes the last mile in a food security journey that we have taken together. The work we started several years ago continues to produce impressive results. Over 15,000 households were connected to more than 150,000 meals using our chat and text service. 
service adoption rates remain strong with nearly 40% of residents choosing to access emergency food using chat and text when the option is available. The service continues to be a cornerstone to Columbus's emergency food access system as well, with more than 20% of all emergency food being accessed by chat and text community-wide. As a result of our work over the last few years, we know that a third of the people who contact 211 are food insecure. The majority of the residents have experienced um, food insecurity throughout the year for two to three consecutive years. Food security affects Columbus's children of every age, and population growth is likely to increase demand on our emergency food scheduling system, which already links residents to more than one million meals each year. To continue to improve the access to emergency food, we have a design for an automated solution that will enable us to keep pace with the growth in demand without additional cost and expand emergency food access to 24 hours a day. The funding request before you will allow us to develop and pilot an artificial intelligence, also known as AI, chatbot to assume the chat text scheduling function. This technology draws on the smart Columbus energy to use data and information technology to improve the delivery of crucial services like food access to the entire city. The AI chatbot co-designed with Improving Columbus will employ artificial intelligence such as Google Assistant and Siri across popular social media channels to give any Columbus resident access to our food scheduling database. These channels include Facebook, Twitter, and Skype, to name a few. The bot will meet residents in their preferred channel and help them navigate our emergency food database. Each chat <coughs> will end in a scheduled emergency food pickup, just like our current operator assisted program. In 2018, we had the opportunity to realize our vision to provide anytime access to emergency food for all Columbus residents in a way that is easily accessible, convenient, and financially sustainable. The chatbot will reduce our need to add additional salaried operators without compromising the quality of our service. On the contrary, service quality and resident satisfaction are projected to increase as a result of opening new access channels, expanding scheduling hours, and providing self-service options. Your funding support makes it possible for us to achieve the goal together. Thank you again for your continued support and for supporting the final phase of our plan this evening. Thank you, Ms. Wright, for coming down. And just, um, I will please share with Ernest, um, Mr. Perry, who is the President and CEO, this really has been an honor to work with, with Hands on Central Ohio. Um, two and a half years ago, we started on this journey. Mm -hmm. We have won, I know, a national award based upon the work of, of um, chat and text. And now it's time to go to the very next level, which mm -hmm. is um, anytime access using the AI bot. So just appreciate the leadership, appreciate thinking outside the box. We wish that individuals would not have to have emergency food, but again, that's where we are in our community. Mm -hmm. And so, but since we, it, since that is a concern, we know that we wanna make sure that people have access to the food that they need. And this program does that. So thank you. thank you for the leadership and thank you for working together in the last two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. That's all I have in my Health and Human Services Committee this evening. Thank you, Chair Tyson. We have one uh, final piece of legislation in the Rules and Reference Committee. I know we're right up against uh, zoning, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, get this piece uh, before council. So Ordinance 2183-2018 is to find legal sufficient a petition for a proposed amendment to the Charter of the City of Columbus titled to establish a community bill of, of rights for water, soil, and air protection and to prohibit gas and oil extraction and related activities and projects and to declare an emergency. Back in 2017, petitioners filed with the city clerk and began collecting signatures. One year later, the petitioners returned with 18,404 signatures. The Franklin County Board of Elections certified these uh, petitions and found that there were enough valid signatures to make it onto the November ballot. Furthermore, City Attorney Klein has advised this council that the petition meets the form requirements set forth in Section 42-5 of the City Charter. At this point, City Council is legally obligated to, one, uh, pass legislation stating that the council finds the petition legally sufficient, and that is what this legislation is doing this evening. And secondly, to, this council must either pass the ordinance as submitted by council uh, vote or put the ordinance before Columbus voters. 
On July 30th, council will pass legislation to put this proposal on the November ballot. Ordinance 2183 does not opine on whether or not this potential ordinance is constitutional or if it will be overturned by the courts at a later point. That is outside of the purview of this council and outside of the city attorney's purview. Based on the requirements of the city charter, council is obligated to act, and we are not making a moral claim for or against this initiative by placing it on the ballot. We are carrying out the rules set forth in, the, in our city's constitution. Do any of my colleagues have any comments? City Attorney. Uh, thank you, President Harden. I would just like to kind of reiterate what I have written to members of council and to Clerk Blevins. Uh, in a memorandum dated July 19th, 2018, uh, regarding this issue that you did touch upon a couple aspects. But as required by Section 42.9 of the Columbus City Charter, the city clerk forwarded to me a copy of initiative petition filed with her office on June 26, 2018, entitled by the petitioners as to establish a community bill of rights for water, soil, and air protection, and to prohibit gas and oil extraction and related activities and projects. I'm required by that same section to advise on the legal sufficiency of the petition based upon any applicable local, state, and federal laws, rules, and regulations. Further, uh, and I think it's important to highlight this section, which is section 4211, which states, no city officer may consider the subject matter of a petition when determining the legal sufficiency thereof. Uh, in a memorandum dated July 6, 2017, my predecessor, City Attorney Richard C. Pfeiffer, reported to council that he conducted an initial review of the pre-circulating filing uh, of this petition as required by Section 42.5 of the Charter and opined that it did uh, address a single subject and did meet the requirements as to form. Uh, the form and content of the petition as filed on June 26, 2017 are the same, and I find no new deficiency in the form of the petition that would render it legally insufficient. With respect to the substance of the petition, I again note that the considerations of the subject matter of a petition is prohibited by City Charter Section 4211. Determination of compliance with the single subject requirement would fall under the ex uh, exception language that's outlined therein. However, Section 4211 does not alter the long-established law that a city council's constitutional authority to review the sufficiency of petitions is limited to matters of form, not to matters of substance. In other words, substantive issues, such as the constitutionality of any proposal submitted to council, is not within the scope of municipal officials to decide. Here, they're, here, while petitioners have raised serious and legitimate policy concerns, there are serious legal concerns about the legality of this proposal given a 2015 Ohio Supreme Court decision involving a very similar issue. Uh, but as I stated, looking at the legal merits or constitutionality of this proposal is not within council's legal authority. In sum, it's my opinion, uh, and city council and city clerk are so advised that the initiative petition filed with the city clerk on June 26, 2018, uh, that I've already read the title, is legally sufficient as to form for purposes of section 42.9 of this uh, Columbus City Charter. And to the extent this petition may have deficiencies such as constitutionality of the proposal, it is not within city council's discretion to consider this uh, and your determination of sufficiency. Council can only look at sufficiency and it is my conclusion that these petitions are legally sufficient. Thank you, city attorney. We have three speakers on uh, this ordinance. The first is Carolyn Hardin. Harding. Welcome, Ms. Carolyn, uh, back to council. Thank you, President Hardin and all council members. We know you well, <laughs> you know us. For 40 years of my life, I've lived in the Columbus area. Born and raised in Worthington, started my first business in Grandview, married and gave birth to our son in the short north, and raised our two kids in Clintonville and Bexley. And every single one of these communities buys their water from Columbus. In fact, over 19 Columbus metro communities buy their water from Columbus. And the few that don't are still all downstream from the upper Scioto watershed. There are 13 active frac waste injection wells in the upper Scioto watershed, 
Columbus's water supply. The fracking process takes millions of gallons of fresh water, sand, 700 plus chemicals, combines with radioactive elements from the shale itself, creates millions of gallons of toxic, radioactive frac waste per frac. The Ohio Department of Natural Resources permits this toxic, radioactive waste to be injected into old, abandoned, vertical oil wells, often in farm fields in the upper Scioto watershed where it can spill, leak, seep, and migrate into the Columbus water supply. This is not good for Columbus. There's a permit to dump solid frac waste drill cuttings just three miles from here on the banks of the Alum Creek. Frac drill cuttings are potentially highly radioactive and very water soluble. This is not good for Columbus. Last week, ODNR quoted, state laws governing the safety of drilling and waste disposal are among the nation's strongest. What if Columbus citizens don't want any neurotoxic, endocrine disruptive, carcinogenic, radioactive frac waste to be dumped into their water source. In 2004, state legislators, not the people, took away local control from communities and gave ODNR complete jurisdiction over all oil and gas drilling and dumping of waste. What can we, the people, do to protect our water, air, soil, our community from this corporate harm the Ohio Constitution says in Article 1, Section 2, all political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for their equal protection and benefit, and they have the right to alter, reform, or abolish the same whenever they may deem it necessary. One paragraph. The Columbus Community Bill of Rights, when passed this November, will give Columbus citizens the right to protect our water, air, and soil, the right for a sustainable energy future, the right to prohibit oil and gas extraction and related activities within our city, and the right to hold neighboring communities accountable should they violate these rights, and the right for local self-governance. Now this is good for Columbus. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carolyn. Uh, the next person to come before council is Karen Delbell. Is that Delbell? Ms. Karen, welcome to council. Reminder, you have three minutes, and because we're a little over, I'm going to keep us to the three minutes. Council President Shannon Harden, Council President Pro Temp. Michael Stinziano, Council Members Elizabeth Brown, Mitchell Brown, Emmanuel Ramey, Priscilla Tyson, and Jiza Page. My name is Corinne Dybel, and I am a grandmother with, who deeply cares about life. And I long to touch that place in each of you that also values life. Since our state officials have given oil and gas interests the right to poison our water, air, and soil, I invite each of you to take this opportunity today to protect our children from such abuse of power. When our elected officials and government defend oil gas interests, who is protecting our children? Whose children drink this water, breathe the air, and eat the food grown on contaminated soil poisoned by fracking waste? 
I invite you to especially consider the harm to the unborn, the infants, and the young people who are most impacted by fracking waste in our watershed and in the landfills that have been approved to receive this waste in Columbus. What will it take to vote today for the people and the environment? I invite you to stand up for clean air, safe water, safe soil, and local control. Will you take this risk with us to do what is right? I remind each of you that none of us are exempt from the consequences of the increase of illnesses and the destruction to our earth from fracking waste. We and the earth are one. What we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. I beg you to care for yourselves as well as all children and all grandchildren by adopting this ordinance today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the last speaker to come before council on this ordinance is Sandy Bozanius. Welcome back to council, Sandy. I'm starting to feel this is my second home. <laughs> <laughs> this is your house, too. <laughs> Good point. So, um, thank you for having me here today and um, to, to all the members of city council and also to you, President Harding, who last a couple of weeks ago um, applauded Columbus Community Bill of Rights efforts to protect our a city of Columbus's water, yet also question the legality to do so. And I know this is a, a major question for everyone. And I'd like to address that issue today. How can it be illegal for us or anyone to protect their environment? The answer we are told is HB 278, which as a state law um, supersedes local laws, so it would supersede ours. Yet, HB 278 is a most peculiar bill, and for three main reasons. One, in 2004, it ceded our local control of the gas and oil industry to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, at least the control, the last message that we had. Why in 2004, just before the fracking boom? Two, its origins. Who proposed HB 278, and who has most profited from it? Certainly not most local people, unless they sold the property and then moved on, because you can't stay on that property otherwise. So why was this bill even proposed? And this brings us to my last point about it. Three, the lack of local input into HB 278. There was no groundswell of support, for popular support, for the state to take control of our environment like this. Yes, the gas and oil industry wanted it, um, and the, it's phenomenal profits, and phenomenally profit they have. But, of course, they're not the ones who have to drink this water. We do, and everybody on this, uh, uh, up on this um, stage, your kids too. <clears throat> Having spent the last five years collecting signatures for this ordinance um, to ban fracking and its operations, we can assure you, every, the other colleagues just in our little uniforms here, um, despite, um, can assure you that despite extensive industry campaigns lauding the benefits and safety of fracking, very few locals are buying this message. Even without a comparable counter campaign, our Bill of Rights has not been a hard sell. Quite the opposite. Just the mention of fracking prompts some people to grab our petitions out of our hands to sign it. Many add personal accounts of the fracking's devastating consequences to loved ones and the beloved communities from whence they came. Most people, of course, inherently understand that toxin and radioactive waste injected into our watershed will one day make its way into our water, soil, and air and contaminate it all. I appreciate questions concerning the legality of our effort to protect our environment. In fact, I welcome it. We all do. After all, you are entrusted to represent and protect us, so you must know all the facts. 
Also, given HP 278, your concerns are understandable, that is, until these other factors are considered. Once again, my three points. The motives, be the motives behind HP 278 that permits the poisoning of our environment, the neurological and cancerous dangers of fracking waste, and the U.S. and Ohio Constitution, which give us inalienable rights to protect ourselves, to determine our own, our own laws, and to um, ensure that we have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How can then protecting our environment be, be illegal? The answer, it's not illegal. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Do you have any questions? Are there any questions or comments from this dais? Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Prior to passage, I'd first like to amend this legislation to correct some minor language within the ordinance. It was originally written with language defining this as a charter amendment, as all previous petitions have been, when in fact this is an initiated ordinance. This amendment makes that change. So first I move to amend ordinance 2183 as submitted to the clerk. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. Passed. Now I move to pass ordinance 2183, 2018. Please call the, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. Thank you. I make it a motion for adjournment. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. This meeting is adjourned. We will take non-agenda speakers after our zoning meeting, which will begin momentarily. Thank you. Regular meeting number 42 will now come to order. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. We will now go to the zoning committee. Uh, all members, uh, Council Member Tyson chairs this committee and all members serve on the committee. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents, three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side. And we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the, of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against a council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. And say, I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. All right, so the first ordinance is 0651-2018 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.037 R2F residential district, 3312.49 minimum numbers of parking spaces required, 3332.05 area district lot width requirements, 3332.14 R2F area district requirements, 3332.19 fronting on a public street, 3332.26 minimum side yard permitted, and 3332.27 rear yard for the property located at 983 Michigan Avenue to permit two single unit dwellings on one lot with reduced development standards in the R2F residential district. The applicant is R. Ellis Group, care of Robert Ellis, the proposed use is a carriage house on a lot developed with a sing single unit dwelling. The C department's recommendation is approval. Harrison West Society's recommendation is approval 18 to two. And um, I first will ask for a staff presentation. The site is developed with a single unit dwelling zoned in R2F residential district. The requested council variance will permit the addition of a carriage house on the rear of the property. The variance is necessary because the R2F district prohibits two separate single unit dwellings on the same lot. The site is within the boundaries of the Harrison West plan, which recommends one and two family land uses for this location. The plan also recommends that redevelopment be consistent in character and scale with the existing single and two unit dwellings. Although this block of Michigan Avenue has not been developed with carriage houses, the planning division has determined that the proposed carriage house as a second unit is consistent with the plan's recommendations for this type of development and is in character and scale with the existing surrounding single and two unit dwellings. Therefore, City's Department's recommendation is for approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you. Is Robert Ellis in the audience? Please, hello, Mr. Ellis. Please come to the. You have. Um, please come and make a statement regarding the carriage house that you are planning to build. Thank you, Good Council evening. Member. Good evening. Um, I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Rob Ellis. I'm the owner of the property, and um, I started this process late November of last year. Um, I actually originally uh, was working with Council Member Tyson. I had a unfavorable vote by the Harrison West uh, Committee, and I started with a lot bigger of a plan, but we ended up shrinking it down and working with Council Member Tyson to come up with a plan that would be that was voted upon about a month ago or a couple weeks ago. Um, we got we were able to work with the zoning chair and the Harrison West to get approval from that, and. Uh, you know, it's it's for me. It's just a secondary structure, and I work in real estate, so just something that I I've seen in the neighborhood, and I kind of wanted to build instead of just a garage. So it's pretty small, 16 and a half by 26 and a half, fully behind the front home. The home's pretty small, so we shrunk it down from the original proposal, and it's about 350 or 400 square feet. Just going to probably be a studio apartment up there. So. Thank you, Mr. Ellis, for coming down and sharing. And now we're going to hear from some couple speakers, and then you'll have an opportunity to. Um, what's the air commission? Air commissioner is here. I don't think so. But after you make, after we hear from the two speakers, you'll have an opportunity to come back up and give a rebuttal. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the first speaker is Anne Dupree. Good evening, Ms. Dupree. If you Good please evening. state your name, who you represent, and um, and you are against this variance for the carriage house. Yes. Good evening. Thanks for having us here this evening. My name is Anne Dupree, and I'm here with and on behalf of my husband, Alex Dupree. We're the residential owners of 492 West First Avenue, which is the property property directly behind 983 Michigan Avenue, um, kind of perpendicular, just across the alley. We're here today to voice our opposition to the request of variance and as licensed attorneys in the state of Ohio, preserve our appeal rights should the variances be granted. I'm um, gonna jump right to the primary legal reason why we have an issue with the possibility of this variance being granted. The um, request of variance doesn't meet the clear and strict factors set forth by the Ohio Supreme Court's decision in Duncan versus Village of Middlefield. I'm not gonna address all seven factors, but just the two that really jump out at me. The first factor in the Duncan analysis is whether the property in question will yield a reasonable return or whether there can be any beneficial use of the property without the variance. Mr. Ellis is not deprived of the beneficial use of his property. He's prevented only from using his lot in a manner that would provide the greatest possible benefit. The Ohio Supreme Court's made clear that depriving a property owner of the greatest possible benefit does not warrant a variance. In Duncan, the Supreme Court stated, landowners are not entitled to variances simply because they cannot obtain the maximum desired economic benefit from their property. To the contrary, the issue is whether the landowners can make beneficial use of the property and receive a reasonable return. Just as in Duncan, Mr. Ellis is not deprived of the beneficial use of his property. He's only pro prohibited from using it to the greatest possible benefit. Variances are not to be granted to provide landowners a windfall from the purchase of the property. He can continue to use the existing residential home. He can continue to rent it via Airbnb and however else he's renting it out every weekend, provided his mortgage permits him to do so. The second factor that I'd like to address tonight is whether the property owner purchased the property with knowledge of the zoning restriction. Mr. Ellis was aware of the zoning restrictions when he purchased this property. He put himself in these circumstances and is now seeking an unjustified variance to bail him out. This is not the appropriate use of a variance. Ohio courts have made clear that variances will not lie for self-created predicaments. Additionally, there are a couple things that are you know, personal to us. Um, like I said, we butt up against the property. There's a serious privacy concern as the um, second story carriage house will look down into our backyard that we just spent thousands of dollars putting up a six foot security fence not too long ago. 
Um, in addition, there's serious safety concerns. Um, as I mentioned, he's been using his current property as an Airbnb, and all summer long, people come in and out of that. Um, just last weekend, folks were leaning on our fence, on our property, drinking beer because there's shade in our fence and not in his backyard. Um, this creates a serious security issue and safety issue for those of us in the neighborhood. And for those reasons, we ask that the variance be denied and we again exercise our rights to appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you come back? Oh. So just one question I'll ask and then my council colleague will ask. So uh, I know, as I mentioned, that the area commission or the um, Harrison West Society's recommendation was 18 to 2. And I know that initially, I know what the initial vote happened to be, and so I know all the changes that, again, Mr. Ellis has made. My question to you, were you able to share your information in, in the, with the Harrison West Society? Yes, I attended a meeting, and I can't remember the exact date of the meeting that we attended to discuss the proposal. I wasn't able to be at the vote for other reasons, but I was able to be there and, and ask Rob questions about how he intends to use the property, what his procedures would be for making sure that the guests would be um, you know, monitored, what his actual use was. Okay. All right, Councilman Stenziano was just at, was gonna ask about if you spoke to the, to the Harrison West Society. Any other questions for my colleagues? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Jordan Fromm. And please state your name, who you represent, and you also are voting against this yes, variance. Uh, Jordan Fromm, 991 Michigan Avenue, homeowner. Uh, President Harden, members of council, thank you for having me. In full disclosure to begin, I am an Airbnb host. I, I have a guest room in my house that I use for Airbnb. Um, and I want to state that I am a neighboring property owner. I do oppose this variance, and I'm reserving my rights to appeal if this is granted. Um, sorry about that. So I am concerned to what extent the homeowner is claiming a hardship. The homeowner acquired the home uh, back in November and tried to flip it. And then he stopped working on it and left the exterior of the home in poor at best condition. Uh, the homeowner then went to Harrison West Society and applied with the city for this variance request for the numerous variances to build an oversized carriage home, which has since been pared down. Um, during these meetings, uh, on record the, and on the application with the city, the homeowner produced an expedient lie to both the city and Harrison West Society, stating that his intent was to live on the property so that he could build this extra home for his parents to come visit when they were coming into town. This is what he's been presenting to the city, and that is not true. Since he has shelved the project for many months and has retained the property as an Airbnb, uh, listing no, no less than 10 is the maximum uh, listing in the space. Um, there, the person that's managing the property is out of state. Mr. Ellis maintains at least, uh, well, numerous, I'll say numerous Airbnb listings throughout the city, entire home listings. Um, it is not his. It is demonstrated to not be his intent to reside on this property. Um, since the time of this application, again, um, I will state that the Airbnb use is suitable thus far if considered with legislation that's pending with the city. Um, but what we're going to be seeing with the carriage home addition is that this application is simply to maximize the profitability of the property. We're going to start to see two entire home properties probably accommodating at maximum 10 guests per unit, um, as he's done with the first unit. Um, he has not made an impact on our neighborhood of a positive nature. He has not renovated the home. He has not added it to the housing stock and increased the value of our neighborhood. And furthermore, he's exploiting the convenient location of downtown by using this use in such a manner. Um, I am confident that by seeing this go through, we will deal, we as neighbors, and I have other neighbors joining me as well, we will see um, ourselves carrying the weight of the intended property use of this, whether or not he's stating that truthfully to council, whether or not he's stating that truthfully to Harrison West Society, and it is quite disappointment, quite a disappointment. Um, so although there may be a hardship in relationship to the land use regulations in the zoning class, and with this particular parcel, um, a variance request is an expedient and an important approach to participating in our neighborhood's pattern of investment. Uh, as Ms. Dupree in indicated, um, he knew what he was getting into, and now he's trying to get as much as he can out of this property with no intent to live on the property, regardless of his statement to the city and to Harrison West Society. 
and we welcome his property as an Airbnb, as is if he continues to make improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fromm. And again, I'm going to ask you the same question. Absolutely. Did you have the opportunity to share your thoughts and comments with the Harrison West Society? I was out of town, and I was not willing to send a, another person to speak on my behalf. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Um, Ellis, do you want to come up and make any, any additional a rebuttal to those comments? Okay. You don't have one minute. You have um, okay. All right, I was just wondering. So I can tell you, I bought the home on, I closed in November, and I actually, I thought I could just build a carriage house. So I applied with the city on November 27th. Um, throughout the process, I was renovating the home. It has been fully renovated. Everything, I spent $56,000, and I can show all the invoices for it. Um, the home, I travel a lot, and I have uh, several investment properties that I have the ability to, you know, stay in and things like that. But mostly, most of the time I use, I do allow this as Airbnb. With the Harrison West Society, I let them know that it could be an apartment as well as that. My family does travel and the convenience of Airbnb is that you can block weekends for when your parents come down. My parents just came down this weekend. They tend to come about once a year. Um, and I'm in real estate, so it's very common. I have a client buying a house right now. He'll be here 52 days out of the year and he'll Airbnb it for the rest of it. And I know the regulations are separate from this, but that is the current use. And even even for me, it's a, I have to go through the, I have to apply for a statement of hardship. And when I worked with the Harrison West Committee, I also personally thought it's, you know, a little bit of a formality. I have to draft a statement of hardship. And I used uh, similar variance requests and read through all of the six or eight that have been approved since I think maybe the last five years, and uh, including some developers that, you know, have gone back and forth. So, I know that this was on the ta on the ballot or on the table for the Harrison West since November. It's been nine months at this point. So there's plenty of public abilities to to work with them throughout the process, including myself. I'm very approachable. I'm reachable. Um, I my I do have a manager that is out of state. We has a lo he has a local employee here that does the cleanings and things like that to manage the property. And whether or not it's you know fully, I just use it because I'm very busy and obviously I think there's a higher standard for it. I mow the lawn, I take care of it just like any other person would too. Um, there's not like, I haven't had city code violations or anything that would actually be, you know, and there's the proper mechanisms to go through that. I think with urban lots, talking a little bit about the privacy, it's just, it's the nature that it is. The home next to me is probably, I think probably it's three stories. It's probably 35 feet tall and can still see the same backyard that anyone else can see. Um, three, just a couple streets down, or just a couple doors down, there's a elevated level that um, Joel Roby owned that had living space above that can see backyards. And I think it's just the nature of what you get in down there. Um, my, my, you know, I kind of stand on my application. I've worked with, Councilmember Tyson and the Harrison West Society for the last six or eight months and probably including private meetings with them and, and public meetings and um, I did attend all of them personally. It's not like I tried to hand them off or anything else. So um, I plan to fully comply with the laws and that includes the use of the property. Um, it's fully within my property rights to rent out the units, use them as Airbnbs, apartment units or anything else. So unless that changes, you know, then at that point, I'll still comply with the law. So I appreciate your time. That's my rebuttal. And hopefully you guys have seen, especially Council Member Tyson, mm -hmm. that we've worked together with the city and Harrison West to, to come up with something that you know was approval. Originally, I wanted to come without approval from Harrison West and working with the city and Council Member Tyson, you know, we, we were able to push through and come with a proposal by both groups. So. Okay. I appreciate thank, it. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Ellis. Anybody have questions for Mr. Ellis? No. And I will just say that I have, I mean, when this initially came to my desk, it was zero to 20. Zero to 20. And so after working with Mr. Ellis, 
working with Harrison West Society, uh, again, Mr. Ellis, you know, scaled back on the design. I mean, I think he's done and we, we, things we suggested. Uh, he worked with the, the city staff and then he went back to the Harrison West Society and now it's 18 to two. And so, um, so based upon, I think all the work that's taken place, for those of you who know what's like to change zero to 20 to 18 to two, that um, <laughs> that's significant work. I'll just say that. So with that, I would ask my colleagues to move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1875-2018. It is to grant a variance for the provisions of sections 3332.039, R4 Residential District, 3312.49C, minimum numbers of parking spaces required, 3325.801, maximum lot coverage, 3325, I'm sorry, 3325.805, maximum floor area, area ratio. 3332.05 A4 area district lot with requirements 3332.15 R4 area district requirements 3332.19 fronting 3332.25 maximum side yards required 3332.26 C1 minimum side yard required and 3332.27 rear yard of the rear yard of Columbus City Coast were probably located at 1337 and 1345 Hunter Avenue to permit two detached single unit dwellings on two contiguous lots with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district. The applicant is Likens Companies, Care of Day Perry. Proposed use is two detached single unit dwellings on two contiguous lots. The city department's recommendation is approval and the area commission's recommendation is approval of 12 to two. And if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next one, ordinance is 1905-2018 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3356.03 C4 permitted uses and 3312.49 minimum number minimum numbers of parking spaces required of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 2200 Ikea Way to permit a drive-in restaurant with increased number of uh, parking spaces in the LC4 limited commercial district. The applicant is Swenson's Drive-In Restaurants. Uh, attorney is uh, in care of Attorney Dave Hodge. Proposed use is Drive-In Restaurant. The City Department's recommendation is approval and the Far North Communities Coalition recommendation is approval nine to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1910-2018 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.033 R2 residential district 3332.21 billing lines 3332.25B uh, maximum side yards required 3332.26B minimum side yard permitted for the property located at 3037 and 3047 Fairwood Avenue to permit the expansion of a natural gas utility substation in the R2 residential district. The applicant is Columbia Gas of Ohio, care of Nicholas Havas. Proposed uses to expand existing natural gas utility substation. The city department's recommendation is approval. The Far South Air Commission's recommendation is approval nine to zero. I first move to amend to emergency. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1979-2018 to rezone 5089 Treview Road being 1.48 acres located at 1,820 feet south of Treview Road along I-70 West from R Rural District to M2 Manufacturing District and to declare an emergency. The applicant is BT BT Ohio, BT8, I was a BT OH LLC, care of Thaddeus Boggs. The proposed use is a parking lot to serve an adjacent industrial uses. The city department's recommendation is approval. There's no neighborhood group in that area. And first, I move to amend to emergency. 
Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Now move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Um, the component legislation is 1980-2018 to grant a variance in the provisions of sections 3367.01, M2 Manufacturing District, 3312.21A, Landscaping and Screening, 3312.25, manu Maneuvering, 3312.29, manu Parking Space, I'm sorry, and 3367.15 AD. M2 Manufacturing District Special Provisions of the Columbus E-Codes for the property located at 5,089 Trade Bureau to permit a parking lot with reduced development standards to serve adjacent industrial uses in the M2 Manufacturing District and to declare an emergency. The applicant is BTOH LLC, care of Thaddeus Boggs. The proposed use is a parking lot to serve adjacent industrial uses. The city department's recommendation is approval. And again, there's no neighborhood group. I first move to amend to emergency. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank, and now I move for passage, thank you. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1988-2018 to grant a variance in the provisions of sections 3333.04 permitted uses in the ARO apartment office district of the Columbus City Coast for the property located at 712 Worthington Woods Boulevard to permit a salon day spa with an existing office building within an existing office building in the LARO limited apartment office district. The applicant is Michael Pink. The proposed use is a salon day spa. The city department's recommendation is approval and the far north Columbus Communities Coalition's recommendation is approval from nine to zero. I first like to move to amend and submit to the clerk. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you and now like to move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2007-2018 to amend ordinance number 0246-02, passed March the 4th of 2002, by repealing section three as it applies to subarea B and replacing it with a new, sec new section three, thereby modifying the plan unit development text to permit garage forward design alternatives for the 12 lots in a single unit residential district within the property located at 4800 gender road um, the proposed use is in a is a multi-unit residential commercial development the city's re department's recommendation is approval and the greater Southeast Air Commission's recommendation is approval at seven to one. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. And the final ordinance in zoning this evening is 1882-2018 to rezone 2136 Bethel Road being 2.41 acres located at the northwest corner of Bethel Road and Durker Road from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Grader's Ice Cream Company with care of attorney Kevin Detroit. The proposed use is limited commercial uses. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Northwest Civic Association's recommendation is approval um, at eight to one. And I don't know, do we want a staff presentation? We heard it last week. Do we want to have another staff presentation? I don't know if we, we want, oh, just go ahead. I'll let you go ahead and do it. You want the update of what happened? Yeah. Okay. So we had, <laughs> all right, so what we'll do is um, I think that um, we had a staff presentation on this last week, and I'm going to ask um, the attorney, Kevin Detroit, to come to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. Pleasure to be back here so soon. Any night I get to hear Duncan We're glad that you're here early. I get excited, so. We're here this week. You know, we didn't, we didn't table it indefinitely, so we're happy to see you this week. Well, I'm glad to be back, and I, I'm, thank you for the opportunity. 
Um, as I'm sure most everyone will remember when we were here last week, uh, we were uh, asked very politely uh, and firmly to um, produce a good neighbor agreement draft uh, to our good neighbor, the Condo Association at Bethel Lakes. Um, we have done that, and I'm happy to say that unless something dramatic has happened in the past half hour, um, we have reached an agreement. Um, and with that, I, I hope that that, will, that, along with all the other things that we've agreed to do, um, will be sufficient to allow this uh, council to uh, let us go forward with our project. Thank you, Attorney Dave Troy. I'm going to ask then um, if you, um, Mr. Paul Gartman, who is the um, Lakes at Bethel Park Condo Association, if you'll come forward and, and share with this council if an agreement has been made. Hello, I'm Paul Gartman. I live at 5366 Bethel Park, Preston Parkway. I didn't think I was that nervous. Anyway, uh, uh, yes, uh, I am the president of the association and Kevin Detroit is uh, correct that uh, we did come to an agreement in writing, it is binding. And so we, we as an association do recommend that this uh, zoning application be approved. Thank you. Thank you for coming back to council and sharing that information. So um, hearing that we now have a good neighbor agreement, I first move to take from the table Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. And now I move for passage as amended. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Good job on that. Thank you. That's all I have in my committee this evening. Thank you so much. Can I get a, a motion for adjournment? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. We stand adjourned. We will now move into non-agenda speech.